Welcome everyone to our final speaker event of Michaelmas term actually and one I've been waiting for all term. I am really excited to introduce Trevor Horn to the Cambridge Union. Trevor is a British producer, he's a songwriter, he's a musician. Um, he rose to fame, I'm sure you'll remember, with um, The Buggles and with the incredible hit that I'm sure many of you are fans of, The Video Killed the Radio Star. Um, he then went on to work with Yes. He's produced some of Pop's most iconic um, bands, working with John Legend, The Pet Shop Boys, and Robbie Williams. So I'm sure you're very excited to hear from him. For the format of the event, um, I know a lot of questions from the audience, so I'm going to keep my portion quite short. I've got a few questions for you, and then I'm going to hand over to our wonderful members. Okay. But I wanted to start by sort of going back to the early stages of your career. You've done, you've done so much. And I think that's what sort of really struck me. I knew you for sort of yes and for the buggles, but in, in the research, you've got this incredible multi-decade career of producing so much work. If you could be remembered for one thing, what would you choose? I don't think I have to choose. I think everybody would remember me <laughs> with the video Kill the Radio Star. Um, because I'd probably be out of the things that I've done. Yeah, I mean, you know, relax and, uh, you know, obviously in some of those records, have gone round the world, but Video Kill the Radio Star seems to pop up everywhere, you know. They asked me to play it in China not long ago, and I was like, I haven't seen a single royalty statement from China. And so they said, oh, no, it's hugely popular in China. I don't know what they make of it. So, so I'd probably be, w whatever I'd like to be remembered for, that's what I will be remembered for. And uh, are you happy about that, or would you choose something else? That you I don't remember? have a choice, really. Um, I did it, it's my fault. <laughs> so... I mean, I think, I, think uh, I was, you know, lucky enough to make a few good records. I think Under of Lonely Heart was a good record. I think I, I made a few of the first kinds of certain types of record. You know. And just on Video Kill the Radio Star, I think what's always struck me is it's an amazing song, it's really catchy, but it sits alongside this, this iconic music video, um, and the, the visuals are sort of famous for it. Is that something that you thought about in producing it? No, I actually didn't think much about, about the video at all. It was only after we made the record that suddenly having a video became like a big thing. And a lot of bands sort of did their own videos, but I, I never really thought that I had much of a visual sense. So I, I just looked, we looked through everybody's uh, portfolio and we chose this guy, um, uh, Russell Mulcahy. And it was, uh, he was the guy that did all the Highlander films. And uh, we said to him, we met him, we played him the record, and he loved it. And we said to him, do whatever you want. We'll just do it. Just, I mean, within reason, you know. Um, and I think that's the first time anybody ever said that to him. So, you know, it was, when we actually shot that video, it was like a day. We did a whole thing in a day, and it was, you know, lean into this light, mime to the first two lines. Right, that's that shot. You know, stand in this tube, you know, it was crazy. I had no idea what it was going to come out like. Um, and when I saw it, of course, I thought the front was great when I'm leaning into the light. Where when I'm wearing the silver suit at the end, I, I never watch that film. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like cringe factor 10. So just picking up on something I feel like you keep mentioning, you've been at the forefront of a lot of firsts. You were sort of early to the music video, and you mentioned before you were sort of produced the first step of a lot of different records. Um, what have you sort of pioneered that you look back on and are sort of pleased with? Or what did you start off that you see thriving now? Well, the thing is, back in the early 80s, I was one of the first people to have a Fairlight, which was a digital recorder, because they were so expensive, they cost 18,000 pounds. And you know, 18,000 pounds, you can, you can buy a house. But I'd sold, you know, I sold a lot of copies of Video Killed the Radio Star, so I had some money, and I always poured m my money back into music. Um, so I was one of the first people that understood what that thing was capable of, and I was actually in a position to use it in an interesting way. And it was like one of those moments where you're the first person doing it. So the field is like wide open. You say, okay, why, you know, this song's called Date Stamped. Why don't we have some cash registers in it, you know? And you could manipulate the sound of a cash register and make, using echoes and how you place it to make it something interesting. And I think we were the first people to do that kind of thing. And for a very short period of time, nobody knew 
how it worked and what we were doing. Apart from a couple of people, maybe Kate Bush and Peter Gabriel, because they both had fair lights, but they were artists, you know. They didn't have to make a record. Um, so, I, I mean, produce, back in the early 80s, producers would kind of ask me, what are you doing, you know? What are you doing? How, how did you do that? You say, well, it's this thing called a fair light. But if you didn't have one, and you didn't know how it worked, then you wouldn't do that. And I, I was also... So one of the few sensible things I ever did was um, I gave it to a guy called J.J. Encharlik, who was really a geography teacher, but was obsessed with music. And he spent, like, years in the back room working with it. And because he wasn't a musician, he would come up with the most off-the-wall stuff. <laughs> like, you know, we were doing a 12-inch of something, and he came and he said, oh, I've got a perfect thing for this bit here. And it was Wimbledon tennis match. You know, 40, love, 40, 15. And it was funny, you know, the whack, whack. And you, the fact that you could play all of those things in time was, was amazing. And like I say, for a few years, it was great. And then, and then Akai brought out a S900 sampler and everybody could do it. <laughs> I'm really interested in that time, actually, in the sort of the late 70s, early 80s that you spent with the Buggles, because it must have been a a very different world musically to the one the one you see now. So what was it what was the culture like for a creator? Well, y you couldn't, you know, these days if 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 you want to make a backing track, you you've got so many different ways to do it. You can program it, you can play it, you can use a combination of programming and playing. Back in the late 70s if you wanted a backing track, you had to play it. You know, th there was no Drum machines came along around about probably 1980, I think. was you know, We had very crude ones, like a TR-808, but something like a Lynn drum machine, which only for people who are, who are train spotters will know, uh, that had the sound of real drums on it. And, and that's one of the big things that changed. In the late 70s, when I started producing, I was constantly arguing with drummers. I wanted them to play four on the floor, I wanted them to stop doing stupid, complicated jazz kick drum patterns. And it was a constant fight. When the drum machine came out, <laughs> boom, boom, no arguing. It was fantastic. Um, that was one of the big th things that really changed. But it, it was much more about sort of, um, things were more about performance. But in a lot of ways, it was still the same in that it was incredibly competitive. You know, every, every week, hundreds of records would be released. If you wanted to break through all of that, you had to figure out, you had to do something special. Or, you know, you had to be in a band and gradually, you know, work your way up. And I, you know, I was in a cleft stick because I was a producer, but I couldn't get my hands on a, on a famous artist to produce. <laughs> so I had to do it myself. And then once I had a hit, it's almost like I had a diploma on the wall like you get from here, a degree. I didn't have a degree. I just had a gold disc for Video Killed the Radio Star, which showed that I got it right once, you know? <laughs> so it makes a lot of difference. So obviously throughout your career, you've been a musician, a songwriter, an artist, and a producer. Have you always felt at heart then a producer? Well, I always think that's what I did best, really. Um, but, but, you know, I, I still like singing and playing and... Um, but, you know, as a singer and a player, I did, I'm not really world class, I don't think. Whereas uh, there was one point where, as a producer, I was world class, I think. You know? So I'm quite interested in the band where you've done both of those things, actually. And obviously, I know you joined Yes, and you toured drama with Yes, and you replaced their lead singer, but you also went on to produce for them. Yeah. How is the relationship different to a band when you're, you're singing in it and then you're producing for them? <laughs> well... The singer with Yes, John Anderson, it was legendary high voice, you know, incredibly high. And uh, when I, I only got to be the singer because I tried to pitch the, uh, the bass player a song called We Can Fly From Here, and I sang a bit of it to him. And he said, you sound a bit like John Anderson. And I had no idea what that would lead to, that I would end up on stage at Madison Square Gardens in front of 25,000 people trying to be John Anderson. 
And that was no joke, because John Anderson sings, a man conceived of moments and search to, it's really high, everything he sings. And his voice is pitched probably a minor third above mine. Uh, so he could get to like high Bs and Cs relatively easily, where I had to sort of really, really try hard. I, I, you know, when I was a singer in Yes, I learned a lot. I learned that I wasn't good enough to be the singer in Yes. <laughs> uh, I just, you know, I just didn't have have that. But what it did was it, it, it when I went back and produced them, which was their, it, it's their biggest selling album, Nine Nine One Two Five. I'd been in the band, so I could I could do a lot more emotional manipulation than one normally could, because I knew them all well. And at times, it did, you know, to get something like Honor of a Lonely Heart done with a band like Yes, it took a lot of manipulation. They didn't want to do it, you know. <laughs> I mean, they really didn't want to do it. I had to get down on my knees and beg and crawl around the floor and make them really embarrassed. Because they kept, uh, you know, I've got a book out that I talk about in the book. You know, I had a deputy, you know, I, we tried to do a backing track for Under a Lonely Heart for like a week. And you know the riff, you don't probably remember it, goes, it's really simple, it goes, doom, do doom, do doom, do doom, doom, do doom, do doom. Like that, right? I think Yes did every variation of that. Doom, 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 get along, gong, gong, bam, doom, get along. Oh, you know, we tried everything, and then one day I, I went in, and there was a deputation waiting for me. Do we think this song's all wrong for us? I was like, please, please, please do this song. I'm a famous producer. I've just got a lot of success. If, 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 if I don't have a success with you, you'll, you'll shoot my star down, you know. <laughs> you promised me you'd do it. Please. And I think I was so embarrassing that they've... Because what I told them that I wanted to do was program it. I wanted to put it in the drum machine and I wanted them to play with the drum machine. They'd never done that before. Those old prog rock bands never played with drum machines. Uh, apart from Genesis started to do it in the late 70s. Genesis actually were very good at it. They actually integrated the whole new sequencing software into the sound of Genesis. But yes, we're a lot more, uh, what's the word for it, resistant. Possibly because they were much better musicians and they hated playing with a click. But in the end, it, 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 it worked pretty well. So, so, having, so the difference was... I, you know, I'll never forget the end of when we finished that album, 90125, when we were in the mastering room. Chris Squire said to me, it's all right for you. You don't have to do anything. You go home now. We have to go out on tour. Uh, we have to promote it. And you get the same amount of money as us because I'd agreed to have the same share as a band member. And the first tour that they did after 90125, they each earned a million dollars. The things had turned around, they changed manager. The other manager had been ripping them off. You know, it's funny how things happen. I think it must be really interesting being a producer. And what's incredible is you seem to have produced everyone who's anyone in the music world over your career. Is there a, when you're choosing sort of who you're going to work <coughs> with, is there a uniting thread that sort of ties Robbie Williams, the Pet Shop Boys, and all these people that you've worked with? <coughs> I think the thing that ties them together is that they wanted to work for me, with me. Producers don't really pick people. I don't go, hey, you know, I, I want to do something with that person because it doesn't work like that, um, particularly. People, people sort of, uh, people approach you rather than you going after them. Um, and, you know, when, when, I was it, when I'd be interviewed in America and people say, was, the, was there anybody you'd have liked to have worked with I used to say Bob Dylan. I'd love to have worked with Bob Dylan. I'd love to have done an album, Bob sings song from the, songs from the shows, you know, <laughs> or songs from films. Uh, I was just being funny, you know. Can you imagine Bob Dylan singing, you know, Love lives is somewhere we belong, <laughs> on a mountainside. I can't see it, but it would have been funny. And people have actually taken me seriously. Oh, really? <laughs> Bob's meant to be pretty producer-proof, you know, from what I've heard. So if, you, if you could pick any artist sort of living, um, who would it be? Oh, somebody to work with? Yeah. Um. It's whoever's got the best song. 
It's the songs that are the hardest thing to find. You know, I was judging the Mercury Awards about five years ago, and supposedly we were hearing all of the best songs from that year. And it shocked me how few songs that were there that were, were, I thought were really good. Um, I think one of them was, you know, one of the best songs was Jake Bug, the, you know, the lightning uh, something or other. It was like a sort of folk, but it, it, it surprised me how few good songs they are. And to me, the artist's one thing, it's the song, you know. The song is the interesting thing. If, if you, you know, if I called up Ed Sheeran tomorrow and said, hey, Ed, I'd like to produce you, <laughs> I don't think I'd get very far. You know. People have their own producers and people that they've worked with. And sometimes I've had to work with other producers when I'm doing songs for films because the artist will arrive with another producer. And that's quite an interesting experience. <laughs> what makes a good song? Well, you tell me. It's a, it's, you know them when you hear them, but it's something that, I don't know, pop songs are funny things. When you talk about them and you actually say the lyrics out loud, they seem so stupid sometimes. And yet a song and the way it's done can have such an effect on you, take you back to a place, make you think of something. Songs fr fr from a period uh, generally will <laughs> capture the, the mood of people, you know, how they're feeling about things will be somehow reflected in the lyrics from an era. I mean, if you listen to the, li the lyrics from songs in the 30s and the 40s, the content is quite different, you know, what they're talking about. If you listen to songs from the 80s, I don't know what they're talking about half the time. Um, and you ask me what makes a good song. Uh, well, you can, you, can, you can be sort of a little bit scientific about it, right? And you can say... Well, a good song is actually five ideas. You know, it's like what you would call a verse, a chorus, a bridge, um, an intro, and a middle end. Five components. Um, and what I find happens the most is that people will have a good idea for, 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 for a lyric. Now, I'm not saying this is a good idea, but say the lyric was, I want you to go, right? So they'll write something, and they'll lead up to a chorus, and they'll go, I want you to go, I want you to go, and then that's it. That's never enough, you know. All of the good, really good songs have got, have got a great verse, a bridge that builds up into a, an exciting chorus, a runoff from the chorus where, where the music keeps going in a really good way. You know, the, all those kind of things that, that and if you don't know, you know, you... A lot of people just don't write, and so mostly it's it's finding more, you know, more ideas in the song. You know, like a, that's that's my biggest problem generally when people play this stuff. Ninety nine percent of songs that people play me, I hate. So, and I, and I was hopeless when I was working on the record label because I used to just hate everything, <laughs> apart from maybe one thing, and I'd like like relax or something. You know, I heard relax, I like that. It's nothing to do with the quality of the production on the demo or, and, and, and in fact, sometimes, you know, professional writers have ways of making you think, and particularly guys in record labels think that their song is good, when it isn't really. It just sounds like a good song, but it has nothing in it, you know. The original that it's based on was probably written from the heart by some guy who really felt angry about something or something. And professional songwriters will, will um, just rehash them, you know. So it's hard to find good songs. So looking back at the songs that you have produced and things you've worked on, um, what bit of production are you sort of most proud of? I think, I think some of the Frankie Goes to Hollywood stuff was some of the best sounding stuff anybody ever did in the 80s. Just purely sonically, it was spectacular, some of it. Um, the sound of it, that was mainly due to a guy called Stephen Lipson who was quite a brilliant engineer and, and ended up being a producer, you know, produced Annie Lennox and he, st he produces Hans Zimmer's scores now. Um, but he and I worked together for, for five years. So I was pretty, pretty sort of, 
I think that's good. And I think, uh, I think Slave to the Rhythm is one of those things that wouldn't have existed, that that song, if I hadn't, if I hadn't gone a bit mad and had the idea of doing it over a go-go beat, I don't think that would have happened. So I'm quite proud of that one, I suppose. And just turning back to this very eclectic group of performers and singers you've worked with, you must really get to know someone in the sort of production process. Has anyone surprised you and been very different to how you expected? Well, Seal was pretty different to what I expected because when, my, when I first saw him, he was six foot five. I mean, Seal's six foot five in his stocking feet. Back then, he had dreadies and he had a pair of Cuban heel boots on, so he was pretty close to seven feet. <laughs> and he was wearing a coat. And I saw him across the room. <laughs> my wife said, This is the guy we're going to sign. And I was like, Do you think he and I will have anything in common? I mean, he looks pretty <laughs> imposing, you know? But then, uh, from the first moment I started talking to him, I realized that my preconceptions, I'd never really met an African man before. And I was fascinated, you know? Um, Seal was, had the, has the best manners just about of any man I know. You know, opening doors for people, just being kind and considerate. And the first thing he said to me was, uh, I was mixing a track of the guy called, uh, the guy called Terry Reed had sung. Terry Reed's old singer from the 60s, brilliant singer. And Seal said, oh God, he's got a great voice, hasn't he? And I thought, oh, that's a good sign. Because I, I always think, People who are really good don't care. They, they, they're not jealous of other people, and so they can praise them, and they're not feeling insecure. And so I always like it when somebody likes somebody else, you know. I mean, I've had a couple of hilarious meetings with artists where they spend the first half hour dissing their previous producer, and then they want me to produce them. I think, like, God, I'm going to produce you, and then I'll be the one that gets dissed, you know. Uh, so I... I, um, you have to like people because you're going to spend a lot of time with them. And Seal's quite funny and he's got a very naughty sense of humour. Um, he loves, you know, double entendres and all that kind of stuff. And in fact, if anybody says anything around Seal, he and I always look at each other. If somebody says, can you take that up the octave? You know, that's generally a, take it up the octave, is generally a sort of time for humour. So... But, you know, when you make a record with somebody, you've got to like them, you've got to get on with them. You know, ABC, I liked ABC. They were good fun to be around. Grace Charles was a good laugh, too, but we didn't see much of her. <laughs> but when she was there, she was definitely a presence. So I've got a few more questions. I want to give the members a chance. I'm going to ask one more thing. Okay. Um, you've presided over the beginning of so much and all these sort of exciting innovations. Looking forward, what do you think is next? Death. <laughs> for me anyway um, sorry to be gloomy um, looking forward I don't know to me the music scene is all dependent on who's in it if there was somebody here now who loved country music and decided that they were going to write a new kind of country music and they were going to go into that medium and revolutionise it then we might see an upsurge in country music it's all down to people wanting to do things, really. You know, taking an interest in doing stuff. I don't think that you can really sort of predict it. I mean, music, stay, if you think, you know, I've, I've watched it now for 50 years, and certain things have never changed. The music that's played at the weekend um, is basically music to accompany mating, or the thoughts of mating, and so all of the lyrics relate to mating and having children ultimately in some kind of way. Love past, love coming, love that you missed, you know. That's never changed. Uh, with a great big thump in B, it's the same, that's all the same. What's really changed is obviously demographics uh, have changed. And so there's a lot more, there's a lot more hip hop now than there ever was back in, in, in you know, my day because that reflects the, the, the you know, society. Um, I honestly don't know. I, do, I don't hear any movements of any description. And it's almost like everything's been 
isolated and it's all in these little pockets and within each little, you know, I, I, I was on a show where they were all DJs and they keep referring to like G, DJ Knotbuster, DJ <laughs> Gravel Voice, DJ this or a Raging DJ, you know, all these names of exotic names of people who probably are quite ordinary but when they're making records and DJing they have these crazy names and they and you know you'll say DJ Nutbuster I've never heard of him <laughs> haven't you heard of you know get your nuts out it's a classic no uh, so I, it to me a lot of it's like that now you know on that I'm gonna give our members a chance to ask questions and that was an extremely fast hand so <laughs> Hello, um, thank you very much for coming. Um, my dad was a music journalist in the 1980s, and the consequence of that was that I grew up listening to Propaganda and the Pet Shop Boys and ABC and nothing else. So <laughs> my favourite song of all time is the 10-minute version of Dr. Mabusa, and the reason that I love it so much is I just have this image of you going completely mad with the drums and the stuff that go on for about four minutes, and you just sort of... The idea of a producer just literally losing their mind and producing something completely bonkers and yet so brilliant. And I just wondered, is there anything about that song that I should know that would make me love it even more? Dr. Abusa. Yeah. Well, I remember I, I, I listened to some stuff by Einstein Neubarten and I was quite intrigued by it. And uh, I was thinking about, I had Louis Jardine come in to put percussion on Dr. Mabusa. And I was sitting having breakfast and I looked out and there was a great big iron bathtub out in the garden uh, because they'd been pulling out bathrooms in the house. I thought, well, so I got my roadie to throw it in the van and I went and I bought a sledgehammer and a few other things. And then I, I went to a crockery shop and it was so funny because the guy kept saying, you know, what sort of china are you after, sir? And I was like, how much does it cost? What's the cheapest white one? Great, I'll have a whole set of that. And... Uh, uh, do you want the, you know, <laughs> I'm just going to break it all, right? So I just want it. And uh, I took all of this into the studio and, and, and we put a great big uh, tarpaulin on the floor and I, we set up the bathtub, sledgehammers. I had an axe and a few other things and some wood. And I had a great big stepladder. And my main memory from that session is the sight of Louis Jardine, who's a big fella, smoking a cigar. He's Portuguese, with a pair of great big boots on it, at the top of this stepladder, pouring buckets of uh, crockery <laughs> onto this, into this great big tub. And we had microphones in the tub. So that's what's on Dr. Mabusa. <laughs> what, was your father, what was your father's name? Did. He tells me about how he like, went to Jean-Michel's yard's flat and asked him loads of questions about things. It all sounds very cool. Um, because I, I once did something really daft to a, a journalist called Jack Barron. Remember Jack Barron? I had a starting pistol. And Jack Barron had once written a bad review of one of my records. And I knew he was upstairs interviewing Frankie Goes to Hollywood. So I burst in with a gun and I said, you bastard. I read that review and I shot him with the gun. <laughs> and he jumped up in the air. And I, sh I you wrote about it, Eve. I should never have done it. I mean, God. <laughs> You know, I'd never dare do that now. I'd be in so much trouble. But that was the 80s. <laughs> thanks, anyway, thanks for the question. Uh, just there, second row. Hello. Um, I have a similar experience of having really grown up with that kind of era's music. Um, and I wanted to ask you about particular tracks that you might have felt weren't given their due because of the sort of over overshadowing um, success of hits like Video Killed the Radio Star. And in particular, I'm thinking of my relationship to that album and when I would go and visit my grandma who lived in the middle of nowhere and had no internet and um, I was a teenager or like 12, 11, and I would... Uh, I just had nothing to listen to really and she said well look at your mum's old records and Video Killed the Radio Star was there and I absolutely fell in love with the whole thing and Clean Clean is like one of my favourite songs of all time <laughs> and then I had this feeling of wanting to go back to the music and actually like five years ago that album wasn't even on Spotify in full it was no, it wasn't, yeah. no and 
I remember going back to it recently and finding out that it was actually all there and going, oh, thank God, I can, I can send these tracks to people. Um, but the only play, I found myself have, waiting to go back to my grandma's house so I could listen to those tracks again. Oh, that's nice. And there's so you. many things on that album, amazing songs that if they wouldn't have been overshadowed by the, you know, the, that track, they might have been more I th popular. I think, I think what it boils down to is, is, is in music, there used to be a saying that a single was a hit, you know, a hit single was a hit record. Um, a hit album was an artist meaning that you know you, you would almost establish yourself as an artist with an album but it's quite hard to get people to listen to albums um as, sometimes especially when you as you rightly pointed out the first single is so big it eclipses everything else but you have to go out and play a lot you have to you have to you know go to your audience and and sell your wares really and we never did that you see we just came from out of the blue there was no story about us we weren't somebody who played in a venue somewhere and had lots of credibility i mean we had you know jeff and i have been playing you know we've been musicians since we were kids but we didn't have that kind of i didn't have that sort of idea of you know um projecting myself as somebody else i mean when i met abc abc had a manifesto which they showed me, you know, this is our manifesto. This is what we're going to achieve and this is how we're going to do it. And this is how we're going to present ourselves. And if you produce this, you will be the most fashionable producer in the world. Because we are the most fashionable band in the world. I love it when people say stuff like that, because it, at least it's, you know, at least you're aiming for something. Um, so what was the, you were asking? Uh, any specific tracks that you can think of now where you go, Oh, you know, I, I, I wish that one was better received, or I know that was a good track and it didn't become the hit that I thought it would, or that it was simply overshadowed. Do you have any favourite tracks? Well, in a funny way, in terms of commercial success, a song like Slave to the Rhythm was a bit like that, where because Grace wouldn't promote it, it never really got further than 12 or 13, and yet it's one of the best records I ever made. You know, I, I mean, I'm sure that people who do paintings are kind of like, why do they always like the Mona Lisa? I've done loads of other things, you know. They keep on about her. I never even liked her. Uh, I think that's one of the things that happens when you when, when you do things. I think things like uh, Propaganda had some, you know, Jewel and things like that were, were, were really good songs, you know. And I think I think they got overlooked a little bit. On the on the back there in the dark blue. Um, so, you mentioned Frankie Goes to Hollywood. And I was kind of thinking, because I believe one of their tracks was banned by the BBC. I think it was Relax in 80s. It was Relax, yeah. Yeah. Um, do you think they were like deliberately provocative to do that? Is there like kind of political reasons? Or well, w when I first saw them, the photographs that they were giving out to people were those, you know, it was the very early days of, you know, uh, of gay culture being very overground. And, and they had these pictures where they were wearing those bum split leather trousers, you know, where there's no back in them. And, and Paul had a knife coming out of his fly and somebody was giving the knife a blowjob, you know, those, those are the photographs that I saw. I think that frightened off a lot of the record labels. Um, what was the question again? I, I got talking, I forget the question. Pardon? They were being deliberately pro provocative, but they didn't get banned because of that. They got banned because of Paul Morley, another music biz journalist, because he, he wrote some things on the sleeve that we never saw. Me and my late wife, Jill, who had, had the record label, we'd never seen this stuff. We only saw it when it, you know, that was Paul's department. And he'd, he'd written some kind of weird stuff that's not really my kind of thing, lick the shit off my boots, or something like that. It was a kind of, some ritualized sayings on the single that uh, Mike Reed suddenly picked up on. You see, when Holly sang Relax, he, he sang When You Want to Sock It To It, spelled S-O-C-K to it. He didn't say, sing When You Want to Sock It To It that he claims because I wouldn't have let him, right? 
because I would have figured we'll get banned immediately if you sing Suck It and Chew It. I knew that it was about, you know, sex, I'm not pretending, and I kind of amplified that aspect of it by putting a huge orgasm on it, so, you know, <laughs> because once I started thinking about it, you know, I got more into it. Um, but that was the reason, and the fun, it, when it came to the album, Welcome to the Pleasure Dome, um, I, and I said to Jill, Jill, we've got to check the album artwork. Um, have you seen it yet? No. Right, we better get it. There were 32 sexual acts between animals on the artwork. <laughs> and, and we had a, a right shout out with Paul because Paul was like, this is censorship. <laughs> I was saying, maybe it's censorship, but my God, if, if, if we try and put this out, the women will walk out of the factory. They won't put the, uh, they won't put the, uh, they won't put the, the albums in the sleeve. Sometimes you have to say no. Funny enough, I tell you another story. I was with Jimmy Iovine. You'll have to cut this out. Um, I was with Jimmy Iovine, and Jimmy Iovine's the guy that had Interscope Records, signed Snoop Dogg, Dr. Dre was his big signing, right? And I'm, you know, I met them all. I met, um, you know, uh, Death Row Records dude and everything. Um, and Jimmy was, you know, I never say no to my artists. That's the reason Dre's with me. I never say no. <laughs> Cut to about a year later, I went in to see Jimmy about something completely unrelated. And there was, there was this incredible artwork on the, uh, on the table. And it was a guy with a huge erection and a five-year-old girl. Not, they weren't having sex, but they were in the same picture. And Jimmy was on the phone. <laughs> He's going... No, no, Dre, this can't be the artwork. So you do have, everybody has to say no sometimes, you know. And uh, we managed to, we put fig leaves over all of the pictures. <laughs> right. This young man. Is this on? Yeah. I'm, I'm really interested in the kind of process you take when you're producing because when I think of um, juicers that I admire, they all seem to have very different kind of like philosophies or like approaches to how you go from the idea it's in the form of a demo or some sketches or something like that and to kind of turn that into a song. So I think of like, I don't know, like Rick Rubin or something who like breaks it down into the elements or like, you know, people like, I don't know, I've read about like Brian Eno, like starting with like a kind of core of the track and then building out from there. So what's your kind of like, process how do you start and where does the song go from there when you've got an idea well if it's a song that somebody's written and they've got a demo of it i listen to the demo and keep every good idea from the demo and start from there you know there's no point in trying to reinvent something if somebody's come up with a good idea i always start with whatever people give me and there's always a you know you you have to um Brian, Brian Eno's produced a lot of really good things. He was good for you too. Uh, but he doesn't really do pop records in the same way. He's done one or, did one or two and did, did quite well with them. Um, I, I, th I think, you know, in a, way, in a way, you have to let the song determine what you do. You, you know, if, if someone's written a, like a, you, you can change chords and you can change stuff for people. It depends, depends what they want, don't forget. A lot of the time I'm being hired uh, to, to finish something off for somebody. So I have to keep within what they like and what they want, you know. Um, and everybody's, everybody, you know, integrity or what people call integrity or their integrity is, is, is variable. A bit like, you know, time or whatever they say. The theory of, of speed of light, you know, time, how time is actually... So is taste, you know, everyone's got a different taste. If you're working with the Pet Shop Boys, everything's got to be on the beat. It's, it's, you know, I used to say, no feel zone, no feel. What I, by feel, I mean rock and roll sloppiness, you know? You can't have anything like that. Everything's got to be perfect because, the, because you can't have anything in the backing track that's going to overpower Neil's voice, you know? Or, or distract you from it. And, and Neil's voice needs a certain amount of space because it has a certain vibe to it you don't want to be all over it. You, you know, every, everybody's sort of different. 
And some people, it doesn't work, you know, it, it doesn't work. You, they play you their song and they want you to work with them and you, groups are the worst for it, I've found, where you rearrange their song for them because it's very amateurish. And then they come in the next day and they want to do it like the way they originally did it, you know, because that's what they're used to. And this is going out on a bit of a limb and, you know, so it can be quite hard. It's much easier when there's just a singer. Um, so I, I, I don't know. I mean, I listen to this. When you say my, my man, I listen to this song a lot and figure out how is this going to work best? What can I do with it? How can I make, make the chords complement the tune better? Um, that kind of stuff. And then, and then hopefully my idea will resonate with the singer. Singers are quite, as long as they sound good, then you're okay. So you make sure the money sounds good, you can get away with a lot in the backing track, you know. If they don't sound good, your goose is cooked immediately. <laughs> Sorry. Um, Most of you probably won't know who Terry Reid is. Terry Reid was a singer from the 60s whose nickname was Leather Lungs because he had such an incredible, powerful, incredibly powerful voice. Um, but he also had the most beautiful, gentle voice and he was able to go from this beautiful sort of tender sound to this raw sound. And he had his own band and he was... He was just starting to break in the late 60s when Led Zeppelin were formed and Jimmy Page called him up and offered him the gig in Led Zeppelin and he said, no, nah, no, nah, I can't do it. I've got a tour, but I know a guy. He's from Birmingham and he, he'll be perfect for you. The only problem is he comes with a drummer, but it shouldn't be a problem because the drummer is really good too. And that's, that's how kind of, um, you know, Robert Plant and John Bonham ended up, because they both came from Birmingham, they were both like local musicians in Birmingham, whereas, you know, Jimmy Page and John Paul Jones were both session guys in London. Um, so, uh, that's how they got together. What was the question again? Give me a chance to say it on the microphone. Mm. Um, basically, just have you got any sort of um, background about working with Terry, and how that came so about? Terry, so, I met Terry because I was doing a I was doing a movie, uh, Kansas Zimmer flew me over to America, Days of Thunder. It wasn't a great film, you know, Tom Cruise and Robert Duvall and everything. And uh, they wanted a song for the end. And, and so I took a bit of Hans Zimmer's score and wrote some lyrics to it. And, and for some, they didn't reduce me to Terry Reid. And Terry Reid lived in Laurel Canyon. And, I went to meet him one night and he was such a, such a character because he's from Cambridge. He used to go walk around, you know, with all the shotguns. He, his father had a farm. He was uh, he very kind of, he's very sort of country Terry, you know. And so I used to go up to his every evening up into Laurel Canyon and we wrote this song. It was called The Driver. The, the, the movie was about driving. And we were, we were due to record it on a Friday night Simpson and Don Simpson and Jerry Bruckheimer were producing the film and um, they suddenly called me up and said Billy Idol's written a better song well they didn't say he's written a better song but Billy Idol was a much bigger name than Terry Reid and, and Don uh, Billy was really big at that particular point in time and so I was sent up to Billy Idol's house I never met him before and uh, and he'd written this song called I don't want to be cheated which I hated, um, because I thought, I, did, I didn't hate it when he sang it, but I kind of hated it, you know, when somebody else sang it. Because, uh, you know, we got bumped, our song, The Driver, got bumped, and, uh, and I had to record um, this, I don't want to be cheated. Here I stand, the burning man, singing a song of my open soul. Singing a song on my open soul made me cringe a bit, you know. But that's what happens sometimes when you're a producer. You have to do these things. And Terry was very upset and he got really drunk and I had to hold him up with the mic stand. 
because I said, come on, we can, I can afford, they won't notice it. We can have one day in the studio and we'll, at least we'll finish the song that we wrote, even if it's not going to go in the movie. And it's on one of his albums, it's called The Driver. Um, you know, uh, Billy Idol was, was meant to sing uh, the Burning Man song, where in the end, in the last minute, his record label wouldn't let him. So I had to do it with David Coverdale. David Coverdale was a very completely different uh, kettle of fish to Billy Idol. Because when Billy first sang the song to me, I cried with laughter at the end of it. And I said to him, you should be a comedian. That was so funny, the way you sang it. Because you know, Billy's kind of just Elvis Presley, like this, you know, kind of. And he's funny. Uh, David Coverdale doesn't have much of a sense of irony. And, um, and so it was quite hard, quite hard to get the song out of him. So that was Terry. And, you know, I, I, did a couple, I did a song called The Fifth of July with him. But, you know, I, Terry was really difficult to work with at that point. It was only because I loved him, really, you know, kind of, you meet people and you just love them sometimes. And you feel kind of an empathy for them. He used to come in every day to sing and he'd be plastered within an hour. And one day I tried um, a bottle of non-alcoholic wine. I said, Terry, I got you some wine. Oh, Trev, thanks. <laughs> what the fuck's that? <laughs> non-alcoholic wine, Terry. But what a singer. Anyway, there you go. That's Terry Reed. Sorry. Oh, I thought you were handing the mic over. <laughs> That's okay. I'll just get... No problem. Thanks for coming. Oh, yeah. Um, so I was just wondering, do you keep in contact with Jeff and Hans from the Buggles, or do you um, feel like you've kind of leaned away from them almost? I, I actually, I, I saw Hans not long ago because he was going around with his 60-piece orchestra. And, uh, and he asked me if I'd get up and do Video Kill the Radio Star with him. You know, um, because Hans was very briefly in the Buggles. And whenever I do Video Kill the Radio Star, I always do a bit of a rap in the middle of it because, you know, that uh, Will I Am did a cover of it, you know, called um, Check It Out. And he wrote a rap, and I loved it so much that I, I use it. And I, so I wrote a, a rap for me and Hans that, that kind of went somewhat like this, you know. Um, I step into the party like my name is Mr. T. All these crap film composers have got nothing on me. You know, honestly, I'm as fly as I can be. Listen to my records, get a super OG. And then Hans's bit that I wrote for him went, my name is Hans Zimmer, they call me Big Zim. I've got a much bigger orchestra than him. I've scored more films than any other brother. If you then, together, we were meant to say, if you see us coming, better lock up your grandmother. And then, and then, and then, I have one, two other lines that went. You were in my band when you were 23. I never thought that you would be famouser than me, <laughs> which was true. I never thought it. Uh, Hans never learnt it. He cocked it up every time. <laughs> but I tried, because he was always incredibly busy, and I'd get in his dressing. Come on, Hans. Come on. My name is Hans. Oh, Trevor, I, I, I'd be okay. Hans, try and get the rhythm of it. You know, he's funny. He's very sweet. I do. I still talk to him sometimes. I did a, I did a note for his pro tour. You know, pretending it was from the Buggles. Dear Hans, you can. We've decided you can come back into the Buggles. Let's face it, this film music's going nowhere. You know, <laughs> we've got a couple of rewind festivals. We can't wait to see you. I was being funny, obviously. Um, he's very charming, Hans. You'd like him. You should get him to come here and talk. Out of all the film composers I've ever met, he's like... He's quite incredible about something not long ago. And he was telling me, oh, I get so tired. People want... People just want... They want me to do Gladiator again, you know. It's always the same in the business where you sell yourself. But uh, he's a lovely guy. Mike? Hi. I'm ancient enough to remember you in the charts and counting down on the charts. Now, since COVID, we've had an explosion of people coming back live. Who would you like to return and perform live? Who would I like to come back to see playing live again? 
Oh, that's a, that's a difficult question. Um, I think most of the people that can are, are, are doing it uh, <laughs> because they need to earn money. After coronavirus, it really hit everybody pretty hard. I mean, I can't tell you how many techs left the business. Um, I mean, I used to own rehearsal studios and recording studios. I've sold them all. Uh, the, um, the rehearsal room business was a rehearsal, rehearsal rooms in back line that I was lucky because somebody bought me out. But that whole business, you know, touring, it just fell off the end of, edge of a cliff. People with warehouses full of equipment, technicians, and loads of them left. And now it's really hard when you're doing a tour. It's hard just to get the technicians, you know. Um, so many people left the business. Who would I like to see back on the run? I wouldn't mind seeing the police play live again in small clubs. I'd pay a thousand quid to go and see the police in a tiny place, you know. Not in some bloody great big arena, you know. Um, it's unlikely though. Yeah, I mean, I went to see the Rolling Stones a few years ago and they were still great. Uh, they're back out again. I mean, they, they can't get enough of it really, can they? The, the live business is quite strange. There aren't many people from the new generation that can really sell a lot of tickets. You can count them on one hand, really. You know, Ed Sheeran, Florence and the Machine, maybe. Um, not many, really. Muse, 1975, yeah, maybe. But... It's difficult for me to, to sometimes, I, I go to shows and because I know the mechanics of it, I can tell that most of it's coming from track. It's so easy these days to, to, to have a backing track on a hard drive and to be playing along with elements of it. Uh, you know, I went, to see, I went to see one band that my girlfriend is a big fan of. I'm not going to name them because you filmed this. And I said to her, Who's actually playing? I'm watching the bass player. He ain't playing what, what I'm hearing. You know, I know about bass, and that's not what he's playing. She said, oh, uh, every, everything's to track. We play a bit on top of it. But to me, that's a bit, little bit, for the era that I come from, that's like cheating, you know. Anybody can do that, but that's what DJs do anyway. I mean, that's probably the limit of what they do. If I wanted to make money, that's what I should do, I but... I mean, I'm constantly gobsmacked at how much these DJs make from uh, their residencies and the way that they, I mean, some of them are okay, you know, but it's all, it's, it's difficult because I'm an old musician, you know, and I think in terms of people playing. So the police would be great to see them back on the road. Right. How did it come to be that um, Video Killed the Radio Star was on MTV as the first song? Did you know in advance? <coughs> Excuse me. Or did you just, it was just on and you're like, oh my God, my song's like the biggest music video ever. I only, I only heard about it, I think, when I was on tour with Yes in America in 1980. When did, when did it, no, it must have been after that. 81, I think. Because it was 81. I wasn't aware that it was the first video until somebody told me. Um, I've never, MTV have never called me up and, and talked to me about it or given me a diploma or anything. <laughs> Just everyone keeps telling me. And so I, normally when people tell me, I say, yeah, how do I monetize it? Tell me how to monetize it. Um, I don't know, I don't know if it's such a great thing, really. I mean, I don't know about you. Do you ever watch MTV? I don't. I think people stopped watching it. it for, for about a year, it was fantastic. And then it's like anything, you just start to hate it. So I, I don't believe the video did actually kill the radio star. It knocked him down for a, a round or two, but then he got back up again, like Tyson Fury. I think we've got time for two more questions. <coughs> Make them good. Um, just at the back there first. Hi, thanks for coming. Um, I was just wondering if there's any projects or tracks you've worked on that weren't released at the time, um, and you still kind of like them or kind of regret that they never came out? Tracks that I did that weren't released at the time. 
Yeah, there was a couple of tracks. There was a track called Docklands that I did with a group called The Mint Tulips that, um, because we fell out with them, never never really came out. Um, but I, I, I'm sort of sitting on a bunch of the tracks that I've been working on for the past year. And I've got a couple of pretty good ones. I mean, if people are interested, I've got a great one of Tori Amos doing a, a Kendrick Lamar cover that we did that's turned out really well, where we've turned like a, a rap tune into a song. Because I was looking for songs with really good lyrics, and there aren't many in this particular tune. I think it's, it's called Drank. It's got a brilliant lyric. Um, I've got um, Toya singing Relax, and uh, Mark Armand singing Love is a Battlefield. So I've, you know, I've been doing sort of, I'm, I'm always doing stuff. Um, I, don't, I don't know if anybody listened to it. I think that's the fate of all old producers and all old artists, isn't they? Spend the latter years of their life making music that not too many people ever hear. But still you do it anyway, because you hear it. Our final question. Coming back to care. It's so indulgent of me to ask again, but just as you were talking, you thought of two other very short questions. One is when in the late 1980s, Neil Tennant talks about how the Pet Shop Boys were in their imperial phase and oh, yeah. kind of on top of the world and absolutely flying. And that coincided with when you worked with them on Left to Mind Devices and It's All Right. And my first question, I guess, is I just wonder what was that like and did you feel the sort of the hype and the momentum around them at the time? And then my second question is, you're doing all this pop stuff that's very big and very, you know, must have been a you know, massive adrenaline rush. And then the other stuff that I know you for is like Moments in Love and The Art of Noise yeah. and kind of objectively weird stuff. And I wondered how, at the time, you sort of, one, why you did that and also what it was like to be in those two mindsets at once. Well, the question about the pop, the, the Pet Shop Boys, Neil used to be a journalist, so the pair of them are, you know, and Chris should have been in the Morton Fraser Harmonica Gang as the sour face guy. I think that's what his father used to do. I thought they were the, the, they did that sort of two guys, you know, one guy with a keyboard and one guy just singing. I thought they did it brilliantly. And because Neil used to be a journalist, Neil's, I could sit and listen to Neil talk all day. And that thing about the imperial phase and then survival is so true. And that was definitely their imperial phase. They were, you know, they were, they were just great company. That's, um, in Left of My Own Devices, they, um, they used a line from me because Neil said to me one day, what are you doing next? And I said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to set Debussy to a disco beat. And <laughs> he, liked, he liked that so much, he put it, uh, he put it in the song. Um, he asked my permission first, and I, I, I let him do it, but... They were really imaginative, and because Neil didn't come from the music business, you know, like he wasn't an old singer that had done clubs and stuff like that, he, he had a sort of much more rarefied kind of vibe about him, and uh, he was much more kind of, I, su I suppose, more interested to talk to him. There was a second part to that question. What was it? Oh, yeah. And how, how you do commercial stuff and weird stuff and whatever. I, I, in the, in, I was excited by the idea of, you know, my, the one idea that I had at the beginning of the 80s was that I loved Kraftwerk and I wanted to try and mix Kraftwerk and Vince Hill. You know, the idea of mainstream crap pop but done with a machine, you know, was the idea that really drove me. And uh, I suppose because in a way, all of the 70s, you know, when you got to the end of the 70s, if you were producing records, you were competing with Elton John, Queen. Killer Queen has never been bettered. You know, it's like the same as Frank Sinatra singing, you know, I've got you under my skin. Has never been bettered. It was fantastic. Uh, I realized at the end of the set, there's no way that I'm going to be able to fight my way into that. I'm not talented enough. But, but you know, techno stuff... I liked that, and I loved the man machine was like, woof, this could be incredible, you know, this is something really interesting and new. 
where you don't have to play everything, you know, you can get a computer to play it. Hence the name The Buggles. The Buggles was just a stupid, you know, like the, they'll never be as big as The Buggles. The Buggles were meant to be a, a fictitious band that a couple of guys in the basement of a record label thought up and then wrote the song on a computer. But we thought of this in 1978 when you couldn't do songs on computers, you know. This was, what we, you know, everybody warned me that it was a stupid name. You know, like Orchestral Maneuvers in the Dark is a much better name. You know, you, it, it, sp it talks of all kinds of interesting things. Buggles is just crap. My late wife said to me, you know, you'll regret it. And I've had it around me for so long now that I don't care anymore. <laughs> Somebody said, you know, I, I, I play bass guitar in a Dire Straits cover band. It's not really a cover band because it's got four of the original members in it. But I was doing a radio interview and some stupid guy said to me, so you were in Dire Straits. I was like, I said, look, I, I've been on the computer, but I don't think any buggles were in the Dire Straits. You know, I've got used to it now, so I, so I, you know, I thought it was funny at the time. But um, there you go. Well, Trevor, thank you so much for coming. This has been such an interesting interview. I feel like I've learned so much about the music industry over 50 years, which is brilliant. Um, could you all join me in thanking Trevor for being our final speaker of Mickey this time? Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks, thanks for having me. I, I felt pretty humbled walking in, seeing all these amazing people you've had talking to you. So I hope it was interesting. So thanks for having me. What a wonderful place. Thank you so much. Right, we head out now.